Hi again, Attorney Steve Vondren here with you, the business and real estate lawyer, licensed to practice law in California and Arizona. We're talking in this episode about equitable tolling. Okay, everybody is a buzz in the real estate community about the new case, Jezinoski versus Countrywide Home Loans, a case where a borrower tried to rescind a loan with Bank of America. And the questions I'm getting, uh, I'm getting a lot of these same questions from different types of people. Equitable tolling, does it apply when you're trying to rescind your truth in lending, your, your loan under truth in lending? Can you equitably toll the statutory statute of limitations on a TILA right to rescind? Let's answer that question and let's do it by going to the Attorney Steve Litigation Whiteboard. All right, let's back up here. Oh, let's back up. <laughs> Give me a break, it's Sunday. Okay, so let's back it up here and let's go to the litigation whiteboard. Okay, so we are talking about equitable tolling. Equitable tolling, there's only one T in there, there's one thing I found interesting. Equitable tolling. Okay, and this is under federal truth in lending law. Now in case you haven't been following our videos and blogs and podcasts, TILA is the federal truth in lending law. TILA stands for Truth in Lending Act. Truth in Lending Act. Most people don't even know that, so you're already earning points here. Okay, so you got your Truth in Lending Act. Now, how does this work? Okay, it's kind of interesting. Okay, these will apply, your TILA rescission cases will apply where you have a refinance, must be a refinance loan transaction on your primary residence, no second homes, no investment homes, primary residence, and you get a loan that's your refinancing with a different lender than your first lender. That's very important to keep in mind. You're refinancing with a different lender than your first lender. So if you have a countrywide loan and you do a refinance with countrywide, this rule is not going to apply to you. If you, do, if you have a city mortgage loan and you refinance with Wells Fargo, it will apply, primary residence, okay? So we're talking about you have a loan. Say you got a $500,000 loan, okay? And you, on the date, you sign all the loan documents, what we refer to as the consummation of the loan, the date the loan is consummated, and that's a question of state law under every state, what that actually means, consummation. In California, you'll find things like when the borrower becomes obligated on the loan, you'll see when the loan closes, at closing, those kinds of things. But consummation, let's just take it for what it is. Let's say it's the date somebody becomes obligated to a particular lender, okay? So everybody knows, I think, that's in the real estate community, everybody knows that when you do a refinance loan transaction, that you're gonna get a unconditional three-day right to rescind your loan. What that means is if there's anything, any reason, you, you change your mind, you don't want a two-story, you want a one-story, you don't want this, you don't want to, this, doesn't matter. You, you, you've just got a bad attitude one day, you just want to rescind my loan just to do it. You can do that. Unconditional three-day right to rescind your loan. Now what happens is you get borrowers that are in the foreclosure process and let's say you got this loan in 2013 for the sake of argument, okay? 2013 you got this $500,000 refinance loan and you get into it, you end up defaulting, let's say you had one of those predatory option arm loans, you were paying a lot of money in, and the balance of your loan was going up, you couldn't afford it, so they told you to go get a loan modification. You get into the loan mod process, and then they say, sorry, we're not gonna do anything for you. So what happens is you have an extended three-year right to rescind the loan if, if, and only if, you have material, material loan violations, disclosures, under the truth in lending law that you're required to get. You know, material misrepresentations in your um, APR, finance charges, total of payments, payment schedules, failure to receive two copies of your notice of right to cancel, these kinds of things. If you have that, you have a material violation and an extended right to rescind your loan out to three years. Now this is by statute, so this is actually codified in the statute you got three years to bring that rescission claim. Now, what happens in this environment is the loans weren't in, originated in 2013. They were originated in 2007, let's say. So you got a 2007 loan. Now it's 2015, and you're, of course, beyond the three years. So the question now that people are asking is, can I toll, toll the statute of limitations and go beyond this period. So that's what this video is about. I'm sorry, 
for the super long introduction, but you at least have to have a little background here. So the question is, can you toll? Now, we're going to talk real quick about the Beach versus Aquin case. That's the, the primary law that's been out there for a long time, United States Supreme Court case. In that case, they talked about the statute being three years. Three years, that's it. It's a statute of repose. You miss it, you miss it. Sorry. If you didn't get into the, into the three-year category, I'm sorry. You're gone. So that's Beach versus Aquin. Now, the new case that everybody's a buzz about, trying to figure out what it means, what the implications are, Jezinoski versus Countrywide Home Loans. In Jezinoski, the court cited to the Beach versus Aquin case, so it didn't overrule it. It didn't do anything like that. And the court basically, this the Jezinoski case was a case that said all the borrower has to do within the three years is send the written notice. They do not have to file a lawsuit. All they have to do is send the written notice to rescind. Bingo, that exercises their right. So it settled that uh, confusing point of law that the courts had sort of been split on for a long time. So it cleared that up. But it didn't talk about equitable tolling. It didn't talk about um, getting extended rights to rescind your loan. It didn't talk about all these things. And in fact, it cited to the Beach versus Aquin, the other United States Supreme Court case. So uh, one of the main takeaways from this video is the, the United States Supreme Court is still along the mindset of, you know, it is what it is. It's three years. That's what appears to be, to me anyway, this is my interpretation. It's not a legal advice. Don't rely on this. This is just my two cents for you to think about and to discuss with your real estate counsel if you have a case. Um, so I haven't really seen that overturned. But as we know as lawyers, being a lawyer is not always just what the law is. Lawyers are allowed to make legal arguments for good faith reversals, extensions, or modifi modification of existing case laws. And so, you know, an existing law. So where there are good faith arguments, they can be brought. So the question is, are lawyers going to be bringing these? If so, how do you plug in a proper equitable tolling type of case? Okay. So I put here one of the main takeaways, equitable tolling is going to be tough. It's going to be um, a tough, my two cents is going to be very difficult to bring. But I know from my experience that there are borrowers that are going to want to bring these. So I'm going to give you some case law here. Why? Because, you know, who brings up the case law? Attorney Steve does it. And so I'm going to go over some of the cases that I found, two particular, that may support or at least get you thinking about what equitable tolling is and maybe whether or not it applies in a TILA, TILA rescission case, okay? Um, first off, if you want to get some of the case law, this is fresh on my website, my uh, blog. If you want to go check it out, go to equitabletolling.com. If you can spell it, you get extra points. Equitabletolling.com. And you'll have all the case law. I've got some case law and some things here. So if you're looking for that, there it is. And don't forget, Attorney Steve did it for you, okay? Um, the two cases I want to talk about are, number one, Roddenhurst versus Bank of America. Your citation on that, 773. Federal sub second, 886. That's a Hawaii case. And you have Jones versus Saxon Mortgage, 980 Federal, SUP 842. That's a Virginia case. Okay, so, but we're talking about this. And in these cases, I'm going to break it down here short for you. But these cases talk about um, equitable tolling being a judicial doctrine that tries to prevent unfairness. Um, they talk about in Tiller rescission cases. Um, the one in particular was the Rodenhurst. They talked about 15 U.S.C. 1635F, which is the three-year rescission statute under Truth in Lending Law, Reg Z. And they talked about it's a three-year window, and that's basically it. But then the court went on and said, nor are the allegations here sufficient to satisfy equitable tolling. So they talked about the three-year bar, but then they went on to discuss nor are the allegations here sufficient to satisfy equitable tolling. What does that mean? Something to think about. Um, it says here, the first amended plaint, complaint pleads no facts indicating defendant Bank of America prevented plaintiffs from discovering the alleged TILA violations or caused plaintiffs, plaintiffs to allow the filing deadlines to pass. So the court is looking at a TILA rescission case they're saying it's a three-year bar, but then they're saying there's not grounds such as these two things, you know, fraudulently 
tricking someone into getting the deadline to pass and preventing plaintiffs from discovering the TILA deadline. So these are some things to think about. I mean, if, there, if there's facts that fit that, do you potentially have an ability to bring an equitable tolling claim? Something to think about. Okay, I'm not saying run out there and do that, by the way. I'm just saying something to think about. So let's not get our blood pressure going too high here. Okay, so it talked about that in the context of that case. So really, uh, if you're interested in this area of law, you're fighting, go to equitabletolling.com, read the cases for yourself, talk to your real estate counsel, and get some insight on that. So that was your um, Rodenhurst case. Uh, Rodenhurst, I'm probably pronouncing it wrong. And the other case was the Jones versus Saxon that we talked about. So we've discussed that, and we've got Jones versus Saxon. Let's check that off. Now, this case talks about generally statute of limitations and statute of repose are not subject to equitable tolling. Not subject to equitable tolling. But then the case goes on. I'm um, talking about one of the uh, TILA one-year damages cases being told, um, subject to equitable tolling. And it cites uh, King versus California. If you're looking for that, that's the King versus California case. 784 Federal 2nd 910, if you're looking for that. And it talks about um, fraudulent concealment or being induced or tricked by adversaries' misconduct into allowing the filing deadline to pass. So it's sort of echoed what the Roddenhurst case said. So, or, so Again, look that up, go to equitabletolling.com and look that up, and you'll see, read some of the language, see if you have facts that fit that, but there certainly is some alluding to the fact that in the right type of case, you might have a, a claims for equitable tolling, okay? Um, it talked about fraudulent concealment specifically, I'm going to read this real quick, to invoke the doctrine of fraudulent concealment, this is out of the Jones case. To invoke the doctrine of fraudulent concealment as a grounds for equitable tolling, a plaintiff must demonstrate, one, the party pleading the statute of limitations fraudulently concealed facts that are the basis of the plaintiff's claim, two, plaintiff failed to discover those facts within the statutory period, despite, three, the exercise of due diligence. So this Jones case sort of talks about maybe there's an equitable tolling, but it can't be you just sitting around doing nothing. There has to be some sort of active concealment. And so, again, it, it's going to take the rare sort of fact pattern, I think, um, to fit this. But again, um, these are things to look at. So that's about it. Um, that's the uh, two cases I wanted you to look at. You have your statute for equ uh, equitabletolling.com if you want to get more information. Uh, if you want to discuss truth and lending rescission cases, if you want to discuss Jezanowski, if you want to discuss uh, Tiller Recoupment, give us a call. We handle plaintiff and defendant cases in the areas of truth and lending litigation, rescission, recoupment, whatnot. And again, uh, two final takeaways. Under the Jezanowski case, for any borrowers seeking to exercise their rights to rescind, doing it within the three-year window, from the date of the consummation of the loan to the three-year window, whatever that is, and that could be a critical, uh, is to calculate that date. Do it within three years, providing notice is what needs to be done. You do not have to file a lawsuit within three years, according to the Jezignoski course, okay? Um, finally, as I mentioned, till uh, precision recoupment, we file state, federal claims. We handle claims, and including bankruptcy cases, one of the other interesting things is if you can rescind your mortgage, let's say when you rescind your mortgage by operational law, the security instrument is void, does that make your $500,000 loan, does that make it an unsecured loan? Okay. We have other videos that talk about the rescission process, how it works, what it means. Um, we have another video coming up that's going to talk about um, how we think this is going to play out, the new ruling with the all you need is notice. So bookmark us, click on the red V, make sure that you share this information on your social media networks and you'll get some more videos coming your way. Okay, thank you again for watching. Attorney Steve Honor, we appreciate your being supportive. Thank you.